let's have a walk through another microeconomics year 12 practice. This is again a really old paper. No, nobody uses it now, but it's really useful. They're really good to test your knowledge, test your definitions and watch out for any tricks. Okay, an economic resource. We are looking for land, labor, capital, enterprise. These are the economic resources. And you can see they've been really nice and given that to us there. Next one, we have a PPF. And when it's operating on its production possibility frontier, an increase in the production of public goods. Okay, if you increase the production of public goods, so let's say you go from you know, two to three, it means you're going to sacrifice some private goods. You will go from Q1 to Q2 private goods. So I'm looking for some kind of a trade-off. So I mean a reduction in the production of private goods. That looks to be the answer. OPEC is expected to cut, cut the output of crude oil by more than 1 million barrels of oil per day to maintain a higher price of oil. So what they are doing is something like this, that they previously had Q1. They thought P1 was not high enough. So to achieve P2, they decided to cut production to Q2. So it's a contraction because it's just a change in the price. I'm looking for a movement along to the left of the demand curve. So the answer is C. Here we have, again, this could be extension activities for some of you. But here we have a government buying butter, trying to maintain this price of 15. So what happens if the government tries to try to set a price of 15? The demand at price 15 is here. It's specifically five units of butter. And the supply is all the way here, QS, which is 15 units of butter. The problem is if they want to maintain a price of 15, they have excess supply. They have an excess supply because the supply is 15 and the demand is 5, so there's excess supply of 10. And if you leave that to a free market situation, suppliers are going to cut the price and the price will crash all the way back down to 10. But if the government wants to maintain it at 15, what they have to do is they have to make sure to get the 10 supply out of the market as fast as they can before the price actually starts falling. So it has to spend 15 pounds buying up the 10 million units of butter. So it has to spend 150 million pounds buying the butter to just get it off the stock and, and you know, not change the 15 price. But then it says here that they are going to sell the surplus butter for five pounds. So they have 10 units of surplus butter and they're going to sell these for five pounds. So they're going to recover 50 million pounds. So overall the cost is, well, they've spent 150 million and they've recovered 50. So the cost is 100 million left. Price elasticity of supply. Let's write that down. PS, percentage change, so always quantity on the top. Price in the bottom. Complete market failure. Okay, market has completely failed when there is no production. So if I were to draw a graph, this graph would be empty in the context of complete market failure. And the only ones that can do that, oh, the word missing market, that's a really that's a good clue actually, is a public good. Public goods, there's no provision whatsoever because they are non-excludable and non-rival. Non-excludable and non-rival. Those two things cause complete market failure. Specialization means that you produce only pencils, only pens, and you will have a really difficult time paying your suppliers, paying your workers, and actually just getting money for selling the pencils and the pens, unless you have money to, to trade the pens for. So we're looking for a system of exchange. Some industries are dominated by a few large firms. Which of the following is most likely to explain the situation? So a few large firms is specifically an oligopoly. So I'm looking for, for something like that, why it has become an oligopoly. And uh, usually, if I were to kind of draw a graph, 
usually there's a large cost advantages. Your long run AC is very low if you're able to reach quite a high size in the market. So if you're able to go at Q1. And once a firm has reached Q1, it's very difficult to compete with this, these firms because they have so much lower costs than any of the new entrants. A new entrant might be able to only supply at, at, at QN, so they'll have to have a cost of CN, and that's, that's substantially higher than, than C1. So if, in, if an industry becomes oligopolistic, partly because very few firms are able to get large enough to, to be cost competitive. And so C looks to be the answer. An increase in equilibrium price, okay. We're looking for an increase in D1 to D2 or a shift of supply from S1 to S2. But they're messing with the elasticities here, so that's a <laughs> classic. Okay, if demand is perfectly inelastic, what does that look like? So that will look like this. If labor costs rise, this is going to shift your supply to the left. And if you shift supply to the left, you're going to lead to a higher price. P1 goes from P1 to P2. So we got lucky, A is the answer. Go to markets for goods X and Y. Initially at equilibrium at P1, Q1, both of these. And it says the supply of good X has increased. That would be nice drawing the graph. And both markets move to a new equilibrium. Okay. So what is happening? The supply of good X shifts right. The price falls and the quantity increases. And for some reason, that's making good Y in less demand. So I reckon it's because these are substitutes which is another word for competitive demand you want to be flexible with that so what's happening if good x becomes cheaper people start buying good x and they start buying something else so the demand in the something else market has shifted left which of the following measures of elasticity indicates two goods are substitutes? Okay, substitutes, complements, you want to use XED. XED, percentage change in quantity demanded, divided by percentage change in the price, and it's got to be of two different goods, so it doesn't matter which good, I'll use A and B in this example. Think of examples, that's the way that I do this. So an example is Coca-Cola and maybe Pepsi-Cola, just delete this. Right, so if Pepsi-Cola increases in price, this is being a positive. If Pepsi increases in price, Coca-Cola is having a good day. They're selling a lot more than usual because customers are switching towards them away from Pepsi. So these should be positive. So we're looking for a positive cross elasticity. The YED is, it's good to know these equations, always quantity on the top. And then we've got income at the bottom. And it says here that this is minus three. First, option A wants us to calculate what's happening to percentage change in quantity demanded. So if you rearrange that, it might have been some time since you've, since you've done this, but you, sh you want to multiply the YED times the percentage change in income. You've been given the YED is minus three. And the income you have not been given. So I'm actually quite hesitant to, to uh, give any numbers unless they give it to us. But here they've told us there's a 20% increase in income. So we would be multiplying minus three times plus 20 gives us a 60% full. So that is the answer. Electricity suppliers are required to buy a growing amount of electricity from renewable energy generators. Green energy generators are paid more for their electricity because there is a scarcity of supply generated from renewable resources. Okay, this is a comprehension question. They're going to do something, you know, sometimes come very subtle to say if they said it or not. So let's take a look at A. A says the government pays a subsidy to renewable energy. I don't believe it actually ever mentions the government. The social cost of electricity generated is greater than the private cost. So this would mean it's a negative production externality. And let me just check if they say that. It says from renewable resources. I mean, 
seems unlikely, but let's take a look. Doesn't say anything about social costs, private costs. Government is subsidizing, <laughs> didn't say anything about that um, again. So the answer is not that one. And so we're left with D, but uh, electricity suppliers are paying higher average prices for the electricity because some of it's generated from green sources. Yes, they have said that green energies are paying for more, more for the electricity. So that's it. Be careful to only conclude what you can say. Which product has a market price which takes least account of externalities? Okay, this is a really tough one. They do this sometimes. Sometimes it's in a table, not, not a graph, as maybe as you'd expect. So ideally, you would price a good. The market was working super well, equal to the marginal social costs. And to work out marginal social costs, which we don't have here, is you need to work out your marginal private cost plus your marginal external cost, which we have this one here. We have this one there. So to work out MSC, I should add these up together and get the total cost that society has paid to produce each of these products. So 12 for this one, 17 for this one, 23 and 30. And again, ideally, the price would always equal the full cost to society. That way, everything's been been taken into account. So A has been really super great. That one, you know, even though it had costs, at least the price could have made up for that. And here we start seeing that the price is lower than what it should be. And it's the lowest in option D. So that, that is the answer. That's the one where the market has failed the most to actually set an appropriate price, especially it should have been 30 and it charged only 20, 24. Government intervention to correct market failure may make situations worse. Okay, so this is looking at government failure. Government failure happens when the welfare loss is, is actually gotten worse now that the government intervention has, has uh, occurred. A is a strange way of phrasing something called information failure. And what this means is the government is misinformed about something. They think something's good and, and you know they try and increase the production. It actually turns out being bad. That's, that's ob obviously going to decrease welfare. So that's the answer. European Union steel production declined last year. There was a big reduction in demand. So I'm right reckon we need not that one we need a reduction in demand not that one okay production of steel containing goods by eu manufacturers has fallen because of tough global competition production has fallen i'm looking for a shift to soft supply to the left that one looks good this one's the wrong way around huh. although nothing lines up so i reckon i made a mistake somewhere aha uh -huh. so I really should have read it better. It says production of steel containing goods has fallen. So I'm going to highlight that one. So I guess steel is the right of demand, right? So if something made of steel is being produced less, there'll be less demand for steel. So we've actually got two factors that are reducing demand. We've got the reduction that they told us in the beginning. And then we've got the reduction in demand because people are buying less steel stuff, so they need less raw material of steel. That one nearly caught me out. Positive statement in economics is always something that's testable. Just that's the best way to learn it. Here we've got XED. It's just the same as PED. You just have to, um, you know, use different goods. So this is good A and good B. It doesn't matter which way around. They'll, they'll usually tell you. Here they've got X and, and Y, and we're told that the price of X is changing. So look how nice they are. They, they tell us that the price of X is the one changing. And we're looking at the XED, so it should be the quantity demanded of Y. So I'm gonna ignore this one. That, 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 that's just struck, throwing us off. And when the price of X falls from 10 to nine, let's work out the percentage change in the price of X. So we do P2 minus P1 divided by P1 times by 100. 
which is 10 minus 9 divided by 9 times by 100. And then we need to look through the same for the quantity. The percentage change in the quantity will be Q2 minus Q1 divided by Q1 times by 100, which is 42 minus 30 divided by 30 times by 100. Just double checking that one. 12 over 30 times by 100. So if we have here on the top, we have whoops, 12 over 30 times by 100, and we are dividing by 1 divided by 9 times by 100. Did you know that these hundreds cancel out? Ooh, I guess something that I didn't expect. First of all, this one should be a negative. Oh, right, I divided by the wrong price. The new price is uh, not 10, but 9. So if you do this, you should get 0 0.4 divided by 0 0.1 minus, which gives you minus 4. And that looks to be the answer. Government provision of a merit good can be justified. So merit good, these are goods that have an MSB that's higher than the MPB. And production of this will be justified because it usually adds more to the benefits of society than the costs. But let's look at this. Without government intervention, there would be a missing market. No, that's a public good. That is a public good. Don't use that one. That is still a public good. Don't do that one. Without government intervention, partial market failure would result. Yeah, you'd get you get some production of merit good. So if you remember the graph, the MSB would be here, the MPB would be there. You'd get some production. Your production would be Q1. You want Q2, but that's the answer. All points on the PPF is productively efficient. So that, that one there is the answer. Indirect tax, and we are asked for the tax revenue. By the way, to work out the tax revenue, it's really straightforward. All you need to do is work out the quantity sold and the tax that was applied to each one. So the tax per unit, I'm going to call it. To work out the quantity sold, it's, you know, with the tax applied. So that would be L. And the tax per unit, you can always find that as uh, the distance between the supply curves. This is a parallel shift, so it doesn't really matter where you get the distance from. Uh, so for example, the distance between H and K would give me that distance there. And so we are going across all the units up to L, because we've sold 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way to L. And each unit's been taxed that much, that gives me the tax revenue as E, G, H, K. A good is excludable definition. So we're looking for something that you can prevent somebody from using it. That's the one there. In a typical demand schedule, it just means a marked curve. Quantity demanded varies, not directly. Directly would mean as price increases, quantity increases. That's a supply curve. Uh, so we're looking for something that would be the opposite be like you know as price increases quantity decreases so we're looking for inversely here we have the msb being literally higher at every quantity we can see for example that z msb is here and the mpb is there so we're looking at the msb is higher than the mpb and this is like the definition of a commercial good at the same time, we've got the MSC literally being higher than the MPB. And what that means is society is facing a higher cost than the firm is actually paying. So this is a really harmful situation. And this is a, a negative production externality. We have that combination of those two things was really interesting, but that could happen. So to find the optimum output, what we need to do is we need to find where these social curves coincide because that would be the ideal if people had really considered the full costs and benefits of something not just to themselves but to society so we're looking for x to be the optimum by the way you don't just want just x to be produced you want everything up to x you want the 0 1 2 3 all the way to x which means that this this one here is the answer which combination is most likely to be consistent with the source of market failure identified. Okay, missing market should be a public good. 
<laughs> which is not not healthcare. Healthcare is excludable. If you don't have the money to pay for surgery or the doctors don't have the time, they could say, no, thank you, we, we can't help you. So that's not a public good. Positive externalities in consumption. You want something that helps not just yourself, but other people. And it could be education, for example, by increasing your education levels, you might help your future workplace at just creating better products in the future. To correct the market failure, minimum prices and, and maximum prices too, they decrease quantity. That's the wrong, <laughs> wrong thing. You want more education. So that, that didn't work there. Very good is not petrol. Well, I mean, I guess you could kind of argue, but you don't want to tax a merit good. Negative production externalities, electricity generation, if it's burning coal, for example, could cause global warming. And uh, yeah, you want to restrict the amount that companies can pollute. So D is the answer. Hope it, hopefully that was helpful. Here you got caught out with a couple, one of them, and hopefully you've been able to refine your knowledge and your definitions. See you in the next video. Bye.